Welcome to your beginner's guide for the DJI Mavic number three. This video is gonna go through everything that you need to know about this drone to take off and start flying to get some awesome looking footage and be able to cut that into videos that other people are gonna enjoy watching. So let me give you a quick rundown of what you're gonna find in this video. First, we're gonna go into an overview of the drone itself. Then we're gonna go into the controller. Next, we'll get into the DJI Fly app and I'm gonna break down what everything is and how you can use this when you're out flying. The fourth section will all be about how to fly the drone. Then we'll get into active track and some of the other automation features that you have access to. And then towards the end of this video, we'll dig into what to shoot. So what to point the drone at and what to capture. And finally, we'll dig into editing and we'll go through some different things that's really gonna help you put your footage together and make something cool out of the different shots that you go out and capture. So let's go over the drone itself. When you get the drone out of the box, you're gonna have this strap. And this is different than previous models. This strap kind of covers the entire drone and it actually holds the propellers in place. And so when you're putting the strap back on, you wanna make sure that all the propellers are locked in so that when you're traveling with this, when it's in your backpack, nothing gets broken. So there's just a little flip on the top. You pop this off. And just make sure that when you're pulling this case off, that you pull forward so you don't hit the gimbal. It's a little funky at first to put back on, but after doing it a few times, it gets easier and easier. Now, you wanna fold the arms out to the front first and then the bottom arms to the back second. Now, looking at this drone, I'm gonna just go over what all the components are. On the front, you'll see the camera on the gimbal. And this is gonna move on three different axes so that your camera could always keep a stable shot. Also on the front, you're gonna see two forward sensors. This is gonna be your obstacle avoidance. Now, when we rotate this drone to the side, you'll see that you can see the two obstacle avoidance sensors also looking towards the side. That's the big advantage of this drone is you have those side-to-side -side sensors. And then when we go to the back, you'll see at the top we have those two sensors, but in the center, you have this little flip and this little door has a USB-C and a micro SD card slot. So depending on which version of this drone, you're gonna be either using a micro SD card or if you have the Cine version, you're gonna be using the internal one terabyte that comes in the drone. I don't have the Cine version, so I have to use the micro SD. So I just wanna make sure that I always put a micro SD in here because this version only has eight gigabytes of internal storage. Now from this port, you could either charge the drone or you can connect it to your computer. So if you wanna offload your footage, you're gonna to connect to this USB-C that's in this little door and you'll connect that directly to your computer. And so if you're using a micro SD card, you'll see both your drone and that micro SD card pop up on your computer's desktop. Now also in the back is where you're gonna insert the battery. So the two tabs are gonna to face towards the top. You're gonna to push in and you wanna hear a click. That means the battery is set properly and it's not gonna come out. On the back of the battery, you'll see a button with the lights. You press once and hold until all the lights turn on and then the drone will start powering on and you'll hear that chime. Press once and hold until all the lights go off and it turns off the drone. If we look straight down on the drone, you'll see two vision sensors on the top. That's so that it could see anything above the drone. And if we flip the drone over, you'll see two vision sensors pointed down and you'll also see your two landing lights. So in a darker setting, if you're shooting at like sunrise or sunset, these will turn on automatically to see the ground. It's a pretty cool feature. And you can also turn them on in your settings if you need to have these lights on for any reason. Now on each of the arms, you're gonna see lights and these will illuminate when you're flying. And then looking down at the propellers, you'll see two different versions. On the front right, you'll see it has a gray ring around the center and the front left, it has a black ring. This is because there's two different types of propellers, the gray circle and the black circle. And so you wanna match up gray with gray and black with black if you're ever replacing these propellers. And to replace a propeller, it's super easy. You just press down and then rotate counterclockwise and the blade will pop off. And you can see when you're looking at the blade, 
there's just these little hooks that keep it hooked on. You can mistakenly put the gray on the black, they will still fit on, but you wanna make sure that you match them up properly so that you have no issues when you're flying. The last thing I wanna go over is the lens itself. So on the front of your camera, you have a, just a clear filter that comes with the drone. If you wanna add your ND filters, you need to take this off to be able to put those on. So basically, you wanna hold the gimbal with your thumb and index finger so you don't break anything, and you wanna twist counterclockwise. And it's just a half turn, and the filter will come off. Now make sure you don't get any dust or scratch your actual lenses because this is what's protecting it. And to add on a filter, you just do the reverse then the ND filter will be on and ready to go. There's different ND filters that you can get. DJI makes some. There's some third-party companies making filters. Just know it's not something that you have to use, but there's definitely some situations where you might wanna use an ND filter. All right, so let's get into the next section, which is all about the controller. So this is the standard controller that comes with the Mavic 3. Now I don't have the Cine version, so we're only gonna talk about this controller in the video, but if you did get the Cine version, you, there is a pro controller that's gonna have the screen built in and a few more functions on the controller itself. But the gray controller is kind of the DJI standard for all of their drones. So out of the box, your controller is gonna look like this. We're first gonna put the joysticks on. So if you rotate down to the bottom, you'll see that there's your two joysticks in the controller itself. And you'll just pop these out and then you'll screw them on to the controller. So looking down at this controller, we'll just go left to right. You have a function button in the upper left-hand corner. And we'll talk about that when we get into the app to discuss what you can set on this function button. And then we're gonna have your left joystick. And this is how you're gonna control the drone going up, going down, and rotating. Now next to that is your return to home button. So when you're out flying, you can click this button at any time and the drone's gonna to return to home. It's also your pause button. So if you're in the middle of tracking an object, well, you can click this button and it's gonna pause the motion that you're in. Or if you're in a quick shot or master shots, automation, you can click this at any time, it's gonna pause that action. Now, next to that is gonna be your Cine, Normal, and Sport Mode. This is your speed, and there's three different settings that you can have on your controller. So it's basically slow, medium, fast. Now, next to that is your power button. This is the same as the drone, so you press once and then hold, and you'll hear that chime, and then the controller is turned on. You're gonna press once and hold, and then the controller is gonna turn off. Now above that is your right joystick. This joystick is gonna control moving forwards, backwards, or moving side to side. And then the button on the far right, that is your camera switch. So you can go from video to photo mode. Now looking down at the top, you'll see that there's two buttons, a jog wheel on the left and a photo button on the right. The jog wheel is gonna control your gimbal moving down and up. So you will use this if you wanna make any adjustments where you wanna point the angle of your gimbal. And the right button is for you to take a photo or start recording. So whatever your mode you're in, you'll click this button and it will take the photo or start the recording. Now looking at the bottom of the controller, you'll see a USB-C. This is where you plug it in to be able to charge the controller. Now this has no screen on it, so you need to put your phone up top. And depending on what style of phone you have, either iPhone or Android, there's different cables that come with your drone. And you have this piece that you just pull out of the top. Now this is also your antenna. So your antenna is up here, and it also is your phone holder. And you could just pull on this to adjust for the size of phone that you're using. Now there is a cable inside. It typically comes with the iPhone cable attached and you'll see on the cables provided, there is one in that's labeled as a controller. That one you'll leave plugged in the controller. You'll pull out the other side. So the left side is the one that's gonna connect to your phone. Now the easiest way to plug this in is to take the cable out, have it behind so you don't get it stuck, put the top in first, and then put the bottom in second. Sometimes if you put the bottom in first, it actually gets caught on this bracket, and I've noticed that it's just easier to put the top in first and then you just plug it in. So I have the Moment case on my phone and it works just fine. So slimmer cases will work with this phone mount, but when I add my Apple wallet to the back, it won't work. So bigger, bulkier cases won't work with this controller size. However, if you do have slimmer cases, it will work fine. I just have the iPhone Pro, I don't have the Pro Max, 
but this will open bigger, so if you do have a bigger phone, it should fit in this controller mount. Then that's basically it for the controller. What you're gonna do when you wanna start flying is you're gonna turn on your controller, plug in your phone, and then turn on your drone. And with it connected, you should see the DJI Fly app pop up automatically. But if not, you'll wanna start the DJI Fly app, and then out of the box, the controller will be connected to the drone, and it so it should just prompt you to start flying right away. So the next section we're gonna get into is all about the DJI Fly app and everything you can do when you're out flying. All right, so let's dig into the DJI Fly app. So when you're ready to start flying, you wanna plug in your phone, turn on the controller, and then turn on the drone. And your drone should automatically be connected to the controller. If not, you'll see this screen, and the screen shows a connection guide in the lower right-hand corner. You'll click that, you'll click the drone, and then it's gonna go through a set of instructions on how to get started and to connect your drone. And if it's not paired, there's a help section that's gonna walk you through how to pair your controller to your drone. Just follow those steps. Now, if your drone's paired properly, which it should out of the box, you'll see this screen. And on the screen, you'll see that the Mavic 3 shows up and there's a little button in the right hand corner that says go fly. That's gonna go to your flight screen. This is basically your main menu. In the upper left hand corner, it's gonna show an approximate location. In the right hand corner, there's a set of tutorials. And then in the lower left hand corner, you have your album. And then you have Skypixel, which is DJI's social media platform. And then you're gonna have your profile, which is your DJI account that you're gonna need to set up to be able to fly a drone. So the first time that you plug in and you start flying, there's gonna be an activation screen that pops up. Just walk through the steps. If you don't have a DJI account yet, you'll have to set one up. And then from there, you'll just have to activate the drone. And then this screen will pop up every time that you're ready to start flying. So let's click go fly. So this is the screen that you're gonna see every time you're ready to start flying. And I know there's a lot of buttons here and it can get overwhelming, but I'm gonna go through what each of these buttons are and what all the information is, and it's all there for a reason. So let's just go clockwise from the top corner. In the upper left-hand corner, you have a back button. Click that, it goes back to this home screen. So let's click go fly, we're back in this. Now, next to that is the speed mode that you're in. Right now, I'm in normal mode, and that's what you have on your controller. I'm gonna flip it over to cine mode, and you'll see that an indication comes in the center of the screen, as well as it now is switched over to C mode. I'm gonna flip it to sport mode, same thing. Sport mode indication pops up, S mode in the corner. So next to that is where some notifications will pop up. Right now, it's saying there's an altitude zone at 387 feet. You're not supposed to fly above 400 feet, so that shouldn't be an issue for me when I'm out flying. You can click this button here, and it's gonna pop up with a few settings. And this is your pre-flight checklist. So these are just a few settings you wanna set before you take off and fly. First is your auto return to home altitude. So if there's any issue and the drone needs to come back automatically, you can set which height you want the drone to come back at. So if you're in an area with lots of trees and they're pretty tall, you'll wanna make sure that this return to home altitude is pretty high. Same thing if there's like mountains or anything else, you just wanna make sure that you're up above any obstacle to bring the drone back. Because how return to home works is basically wherever the drone's at, if it loses connection with the controller or you click the return to home, the drone's gonna fly straight up to this altitude and then straight back. And then when it gets back to the home point, it's gonna descend straight down. So just make sure your return to home is set at a proper height. Now underneath that, you have your flight protection altitude and distance. So the max is the max that your app will let you fly. Here in the US, I can't fly above 400 feet, so I have that set so that I just have my upper limit. So you could set your max altitude for height and distance and just make sure you're obeying your local laws and regulations. And this is a way that you can force those limits so that you don't get in any situation where you're flying too high or too far away. Now moving right, you'll see this green icon. This is my battery icon. And right now, I'm not flying, so all of this is zeroed out. The first is return to home, the next is forced landing, and the bottom, your battery completely depleted. So all of those zeros will actually be numbers when you're out flying to show how much time you have left. And depending on your conditions, these numbers might go down faster than like a normal clock. So look at this as just a quick guide to see how much time you have. 
but just know if you're in conditions that are like super windy or you're flying in sport mode, these numbers might tick down faster than just a normal clock. So next to your time is your RC strength. So that's how good the connection is between the controller and the drone. And what right now mine is at full connection. So next to that, the red is your obstacle avoidance. This is your vision sensors. You can click on that and you can see that all of these icons are gonna pop up. I haven't taken the, dr the drone is not in the sky right now. So all of these are unavailable. But as soon as you fly, you'll see that all of that will go away. And when you're flying in sport mode, your sensors are gonna be unavailable, so you'll see that turn red as well. Now next to that is your satellites. Right now it's showing that I have 17 satellites connected to the drone, and that's your global positioning system. So if you only have one or two satellites, your drone is not gonna know where it's at in, on the Earth. So you wanna make sure that you have enough satellites connected to the drone before you take off and start flying. Now next to this is your menu. And this is gonna have a bunch of different settings and we'll go through that after we finish this screen. Now underneath your menu, you have your icon that's gonna switch between photo, video, master shots, quick shots, hyperlapse, and pano. So this is all your photo and video modes. Now to the left are these binoculars. Now this is how you use the second camera on the drone. Right now I'm in just the main four thirds camera. But if I wanna use the explore mode, which is the zoomed in camera, you click the binoculars. So now it's gonna switch into explore mode and you have a bunch of different options for this mode. You have 1X, 2X, and 4X. Now these are all using that same 4 thirds camera and it's just punching in digitally. When you click the button underneath the binoculars one more time, it's gonna to go to 7X. Now 7X is the top camera. So it makes that flip to the top camera when you click 7X. So you basically have two cameras on this drone and then it punches in on that footage to give you a more cropped in and zoomed in image. So if we click this again, we'll go to 14X and 28X. So 28X is a four times crop on that 7X camera. Now underneath that, you'll see your focus. So right now I'm in auto focus mode, but if you wanna manually focus, you can click that and scroll up or down to manually focus the image. Now next to your autofocus is the big red button, and this is record. If you sw switch it over to photo mode, this is a white dot, and that's to take a photo. And you'll see when you take a photo, there's gonna be a ring around the white dot, and that's just processing the image. Now underneath that is your video library. So this is everything that you have shot so far on the drone. And you can see that I have a ton of footage from some previous trips that I just got back from. Here's a shot out at the Trona Pinnacles and you can go through and see everything that's on the card. And when you click on an image or some video, you'll see that it's showing that it's a low res preview. It shows the date and time that it was taken, it has all your information about that photo or the video. You can favor it by clicking the heart or you can export it. So you can use the arrow in the right hand corner to save to album, or you can click the button in the lower right hand corner, which is your download path, which you can bring it into the app or your phone. And then in the lower left hand corner, there's a trash can so you can delete photos and images out of your cart. Now, if you make favorites, which is that little heart, you'll see up here in the right hand corner, there's a favorites tab and that will pop up there. Now also you can go through and batch select. So I can click the upper right hand corner. I can say, I want all these shots to download to my phone and I'm gonna save them to my phone. So now it's downloading from the drone into my phone and now everything's on my phone so I can edit directly from my phone. Now also in your album, in the lower right hand corner you can create and this is for like creating quick little videos using the DJI Fly app. So you can play around with that. There's different templates or there's a pro mode so you can go through and do all of your edits just in the DJI app itself. So if you're gonna use the app to do your edits, then you're gonna just download the footage and the photos to the app and not to your phone because everything's just gonna be kept within the app. All right, in the upper left-hand corner, let's go back. And now we're back to the flight screen. In the lower right-hand corner is your pro mode. So right now it's on auto. I can click over to pro mode and this allows me to take control of everything on this drone. So I can adjust my shutter speed, my aperture, my ISO, and I can also adjust my exposure compensation. In the auto mode, you can only adjust your exposure compensation. So your exposure compensation is basically telling the drone to expose brighter or darker what it thinks is the perfect exposure. So if your image is overall too dark and you want it a little brighter, you can click your exposure compensation. 
and go plus three, plus seven, plus one, whatever makes sense for the scene that you're flying in. And in the pro mode, the reason that you would use your exposure compensation would be if your settings are set to auto. So right now you can see that I have this little A above each of my shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. I can click any one of these, go out of auto by clicking the auto button, and then adjust that setting. So I wanna adjust my shutter speed to double out of my frame rate so I can get motion blur. Now I have my shutter set locked into 1 60th of a second, but my ISO and my aperture are both going to be on auto. So then I could just use the exposure compensation to make it brighter or darker. So you can either go full manual and completely control all of these settings, or you can pick which ones you wanna stay on auto. So if you wanna set your ISO and your shutter speed, but then leave your aperture to auto, you'll see that the aperture is gonna auto adjust depending on what you're pointed at. And so it's always gonna keep the image at what the drone thinks is proper exposure and then take into account your exposure compensation and find the proper exposure. Next to your exposure compensation, exposure value EV, you'll see resolution and frames per second. Now this is where you can adjust all your frame rates and your resolutions for when you're flying in this video mode. So let's go to 5.1K, 50 frames per second. Now, if you're in the photo mode, you'll see that that button is now a format button. So it can go from JPEG to RAW or JPEG plus RAW. Now, next to that is your storage, and that's gonna show you how many photos you have left. If we switch back to video, it's gonna show how much time you have left. So right now it's showing me that I have 28 minutes left. Now you can click this storage, and it will show you both internal and your card, and you can click these and switch between which one you're recording to. Now moving left, we have our information of where the drone is in the sky. We have distance away, that's the D, and we have height. And then above that, you'll see miles per hour. The miles per hour is how fast it's moving in that direction. So next to the D, that's distance away. If you're moving forward, it's gonna show you how fast you're moving forward at that miles per hour. And the same with the height, above the height, and it's gonna show you how fast you're climbing or dropping. Now in the far left-hand bottom corner is your map. So right now you don't see any map, but if we click on this, you'll see an overview of the area that you're at. And when the drone's flying, it's gonna create a blue path that shows where the flight path is for the drone. Now this box has some different functionality just on this box itself. In the lower right-hand corner, you can switch to like this radar mode, which just basically shows where the drone is in relation to you. And then you can double click this and make the map full screen. And then your camera view is gonna be small in the lower left-hand corner. So you might wanna see this view just to see where the drone is in relation to different things on a map, or you need to see your flight path on a bigger screen. So on this full screen mode, you have a few buttons here on the right-hand side. First is information, so you can show different zones. I usually leave these all clicked on, but if you wanna turn any of them off, you can do it here. You can erase the path that your drone has created, the flight path. You can orient the map based on where the drone is or based on where the home point is. You can switch to true north. You can also add layers. So if you wanna do a satellite, you could see basically an overview of where you're at. And then last is indication of other airplanes in the area. Right now, mine's set to medium, high collision risk, but you could switch this to low or high. These are just different settings that are gonna tell you if there's another plane in the area. So we can minimize that on the main screen if you don't need to see the map. Now, the last thing I wanna show you on the screen is your takeoff. So up above the map, there's this takeoff button, and you click this once and then press and hold in the center and the drone's gonna take off. You press and hold in the center when the drone's flying and the drone will land. Now the other way to take off is to bring both of these controllers down into the center and it's gonna start the propellers and then you pull up on the left stick and that's gonna ascend the drone into the air. And then how you would land manually is you just get the drone into a perfect landing spot, pull down on this left joystick until the drone fully lands and then keep holding this until the drone turns off. Now let's dig into the menu in the upper right hand corner. So you click the three dots and it's gonna pull up these different menus. There is a lot in here, but it is organized nicely. So you can find exactly what you need pretty quick. So first is your safety menu and you're gonna have flight assistance. So if you have an object in your way, you can either go around that object or you can break and the drone will stop. 
I have mine on bypass, but you can stop and the drone will just stop where the object is, or you can turn that off, but when it's off, the drone might fly into some sort of object. Next is your display radar map, and this is real time obstacle detection on the main screen. So when you're flying, there'll be different colors that pop up on your screen to show you how close you are to an object. Quick visual thing to see your obstacles in your way. Underneath that, you'll have your flight protection. These are your max altitude, max distance, and auto return to home. So if you don't wanna set them in the pre-flight menu, you can set them here as well. You can update your home point, and you can do this when you're in flight. The home point has been updated. Please check it on the map. Now underneath that, you have your sensors. This is where you can calibrate your sensors, your IMU. It also has your battery info. So if you need to know anything about your battery, you can click on this. It's gonna show you your voltage, your battery temperature, and the number of times charged. Underneath that, you have your LED. Now right now, mine is set to auto. I can turn that on. It's gonna turn on those lights on the bottom of the drone, or I can just turn them off and they don't come on ever. I'm just gonna leave it on auto. Now you can also turn off the LEDs on the front. So when you're recording, if you're getting some reflections or you're seeing the colors of those front LEDs, turn it on auto. And basically they shut off when you start recording and then they turn back on when you stop recording. And it's just a feature that allows you to get a clean image when you're shooting in darker settings. Now, if you need to unlock a geo zone, you'll do that in this menu here. Also, there's a section to find my drone. So if you lost your drone, you'll go to this find my drone setting. And then in the find my drone, there's a button in the lower right, you can click that. It will cause the drone to start beeping and flashing. So if it's lost in like a tree or bushes somewhere, it'll be easier to find. And then there's the advanced safety settings. So if your signal is lost, you can tell the drone what to do. I have mine on return to home. So if I lose connection to my controller, the drone will automatically come back. Now, you don't necessarily always want that on. If you're flying in a situation where return to home is not the safest thing to do, you can either have the drone automatically descend or you can have it just hover. And then you can also set your emergency propeller stop, which basically, when you pull both joysticks inwards or outwards, it will cause the drone to shut off at mid-flight. Now also, this is where you can turn on and off your air sense. Now you're not gonna wanna turn this off because this is your indication that tells you if there's airplanes nearby. If a plane comes nearby, you'll see an indication pop up on the screen that says manned aircraft in the nearby area. And this is something that you're gonna wanna keep on while you're flying. Now let's go over to the control menu. So first you're gonna see your units. I'm in the US and we use Imperial, but if you're on metric, you can switch that here. Next to that is your gimbal mode. So follow mode is where your gimbal's gonna keep the horizon level. In FPV mode, you're gonna see the gimbal tilt. So if you want that look, you can switch it here in the menu setting. Now underneath that, you have your gimbal calibration and your advanced gimbal settings. So if we click into our advanced gimbal settings, this is where we can change some of the settings for your cine, normal, and sport mode. So make it work best for the way that you like flying. Okay, so next is your phone charging. So you can have your controller charge your phone while you're out flying. Next is your stick mode. Automatically, you're gonna have mode two, and that's what I'm gonna be talking about in this video. Now, if you like a different configuration, this is where you can change your stick mode, and this is how these joysticks work. So there's three different modes that are preset, and you can also do a custom mode. Next, let's talk about your button customization, because in the upper left-hand corner of this controller, you have this function button, and you can operate it two ways. You can either click or double click, and it's gonna bring up different menu options. So here is where you can change that. So right now I have it set to recenter gimbal and advanced camera. So when I click this button, you'll see that the camera will automatically go down, straight down, click it again, it's gonna come back up to straight 90, so looking straight out. And it's a good tool to have just to recenter yourself and know where horizon is straight out from the drone or straight down. I often use that feature just to snap the camera back to be able to get a different shot. And if we double tap, it brings up my advanced camera settings. And these are settings that you will change once in a while. So these are the two standard buttons that come on this drone, but you can change them. You don't always need access to this camera menu. So let me show you some other options. So we can have auxiliary LED, that's gonna control the light underneath. We have toggle, map, and live view. We have gimbal follow or FPV mode. We have advanced camera settings, auto exposure lock and unlock. 
hyperlapse cruise control, increase exposure value, decrease exposure value. That's the exposure compensation that we were talking about with the auto settings. And then we have explore mode. So if you find yourself using some of these functions often, then set them to this function button and it makes it super easy to have this on your controller at all time. And then underneath that, you have some advanced settings for your RC calibration. Now at the bottom, you have a flight tutorial, which at any time, if you wanna go back and learn the basics of how to fly your drone, you can click this flight tutorial and it will take you through this pre-flight checklist and some different things that you need to know before you start flying. Let's go over to your camera settings. So this is all your advanced camera settings. First is your format. So you can record in .mov or .mp4. Underneath that you have your color. So right now I have it in the normal color. So it has contrast and it has saturation. If we use D-Log, you'll see that you have a much flatter image. This is what you'll shoot in if you wanna color grade your footage. Next we have our coding format. You can shoot in H.264, H.265. If you have the Cine version, you have ProRes as well. So moving down, there's a few things that are gonna help you mid-flight. So you have your histogram and your overexposure warning. I'm gonna turn it back on normal color and then I'm gonna put on my histogram and overexposure. So your overexposure are those zebras that you're seeing here on the screen. This is showing parts of your image that are too bright and they're just turning white. Now your histogram, that's this box that I'm moving around, that is all of your exposure values from black on the far left to white on the far right. So ideally you just want all your exposures in the middle. And you can see if I turn my exposure compensation up, everything's gonna slide to the right and I have zebras all across my screen. That basically means that everything's overexposed. If I go into my advanced camera settings and I turn off overexposure warning, you'll see that everything is way too bright. Let's turn that back on. Let's bring our exposure compensation down and let's go the other direction. If we go minus three, you'll see that the image is very dark and you'll see on the histogram here that everything is on the far left. That means it's super dark. So you don't necessarily wanna to fly too bright or too dark, you wanna fly somewhere in the middle, especially when you're shooting with the normal settings. With the D-Log, you'll see that you'll have a much flatter image. So let's turn on D-Log and you'll see that your exposure values are all crunched into the middle of that histogram. Again, you don't want that histogram to be at the very top or the very bottom, you want it somewhere in the middle. Because if you're gonna use D-Log, you're gonna add contrast later on, and if it's too high on your histogram or too low, you will have some troubles color grading your footage. Let's go back into the camera settings. Next, you have guidelines. So you can add across, which will give you just lines across both directions. You can have thirds. So if you wanna shoot with your subject in one of the thirds, you can add on these lines. And also you have a center mark, so you could have crosshairs in the center. And I'll move the camera so you can see that. Just as some guides to help you know where different elements are placed in the frame, just so you can compose better looking shots. So next is your peaking level, and this has to do with focus. So right now I'm in autofocus, it's not gonna show up, but if we switch it over to manual focus, you'll see that the red is what is in focus. Next on your camera menu is your white balance. So right now I have mine set to manual, 55 Kelvin, but if you set it to auto, it's gonna auto adjust your white balance. Now there might be situations where your white balance will fluctuate, so you have to go into this menu here to set it manually. Now the last section underneath this has to do with your storage. First is your storage location. So you can set your internal storage or your SD card. Then the one that's highlighted is the one that you're gonna be recording to. And then you can click format in the upper right hand corner. When you click format, you can format either your internal storage or your SD card, and it's gonna erase all your images and all your footage. Now you can sync your downloaded files to your phone album, which basically means when you bring images or footage from the drone to the DJI Fly app, it's automatically gonna sync them to your phone. I'm gonna turn that off because I don't need that to happen. And then last is your cache when recording. So when you're flying at 30 frames per second or below, your DJI Fly app will record a lower res version of that footage, whatever it's seen from the phone. So the image that's being transmitted is also gonna be recorded. And you could set this up to only do a certain gigabytes worth of footage or you can set it to auto. Now the last menu is your transmission. So I typically just leave this on dual band and auto. I've never really had to mess with this, but if you do have issues with your transmission, you can go in here and you can tweak it, putting it to 2.4 or 5.8, or you can change your channel mode to by using the manual setting. Now the last about tab is just basically your information about your controller, your drone, your battery, 
and it has things like serial numbers and it has a place to check for updates. So that's basically everything for this app. There was a lot to cover in this section and I know there's a lot of buttons and a lot of things to think about when you're up flying, but the more that you practice, the more that you're out there playing around with this, the more that you'll get comfortable with this interface and it'll be much easier to fly and everything that's on the screen becomes super useful for when you're out flying. All right, so let's go outside and let's get into our first flight. All right, let's get into your first flight. So I found an area that's pretty open. Got this weird little structure over here, but I brought my controller, my drone, and a few components that you need every time you go out and fly. So one is batteries. Always make sure your batteries are charged. And the second thing is a memory card. So if you have the Cine version, you have that built-in one terabyte drive, but if you have this version, well, you only have that eight gigabytes. It's not gonna last that long when you're shooting at 5.1K. So always make sure that you have a micro SD card and that your batteries are full. And also make sure that all your propellers are good before you leave. You just don't wanna get into a situation where you get outside, you go explore somewhere, you're ready to fly the drone, and then you forgot a battery or a card. So the first thing you wanna do is just find somewhere that's safe to take off the drone. So you wanna make sure that it's not on the ground because the ground has lots of dust and dirt. It can get into the propellers. And you also don't want any like major structures or trees nearby. I've got these little pillars back here, which are actually a great little launch pad. So I'm gonna use that. Or you can go somewhere with some concrete, a parking lot, a park, just somewhere where you can take off and you don't have any issues with you know, what's gonna be in the takeoff area. So you're gonna take off the drone, unfold the arms. Remember front two first, back two last. You wanna set the drone up. Before we power it on, let's get our phone connected. You wanna put your phone in your controller first. You wanna make sure it's plugged in before you get started. And then you wanna attach your joysticks. And then we'll power on the controller. Make sure the DJI Fly app is turned on. Everything's good here, let's turn on the drone. So we're gonna power on the drone, press once and hold. I'm gonna move my sunglasses so they're out of the way. And I'm also gonna turn on my screen record so you can see exactly what I'm seeing here. So let's start the pre-flight checklist. First, check your propellers. So you wanna make sure that your propellers are good to go. Make sure they're locked on. And then you wanna make sure that your gimbal is clear of any obstructions so it's freely moving. Next, you wanna make sure that your controller's connected so that you have good connection between the controller, the drone. So if you ever need a refresher on how to use the drone, you can always go back into this pre-flight checklist and it will walk you through the steps. So let's just take off I'm going to have this set to auto. We are gonna take it off D-Log just so you guys have a better view of what's going on. And I'm gonna just use this button on the left, click once, press and hold. The drone is now gonna take off. Now the first time you take it out and fly, you wanna make sure that everything's working properly. So try the record. Okay, it's recording now. Everything looks good. Stop recording and then land. And then the drone will land. So you always want to make sure that everything's working properly before you take it off and just go whipping around. Because if something's not set properly and you just take off and fly, well, you could cause a crash. So you just want to make sure that the drone is all good. Now that we've tested it, Let's take it off and go fly. And let me walk you through some of the basic motions on how you actually fly the drone. All right, so let's talk about flight directionality. So you have the two joysticks and you have eight different motions that you can do between these two joysticks and you're gonna use them in unison to get creative looking footage. So first on the left side, if you press up on the left joystick, it's gonna go up into the sky. And if you press down on that joystick, it's gonna bring it down. So I'm descending down as I hold down on that joystick. If I push that joystick right, it's gonna rotate to the right. And you can see it's spinning super fast. So let's put it into cine mode and it's gonna go a little bit slower. Now, if I push the joystick to the left, it's gonna rotate to the left. So basically think of the left joystick as going up and down and rotating. Now, the right joystick is for movement away from that kind of center point. So if you press forward on that right joystick, it's gonna fly forward. 
And if you pull back on the right joystick, it's gonna fly backwards. Now, if you pull right on that right joystick, it's gonna to move to the side towards the right. And you can see this tree coming into frame. So it's almost like a slide or a dolly shot. Now, if you pull left on that right joystick, it's gonna do the opposite and just move to the left. So you can think of your right joystick as being the directionality moving away from that center point. So your left joystick is a center point. It goes up and down that point or circles. The right joystick moves away in every direction. So either forwards, backwards, left or right. So the last control that you have is your jog wheel. So if you pull left on the jog wheel, it's gonna tilt the camera down. And if you pull right up on that jog wheel, it's gonna tilt the camera up. Now, when you use these joysticks, you don't always want to be pushing them full throttle, like all the way to the end. You want to feather it. So a lot of times when I'm out filming, basically what I'm doing is pushing these joysticks in different directions and I'm just giving it slight movements. So I'm going to do a quick arc around us here. So I'm going to pull the right joystick to the left and I'm going to pull the left joystick to the right. And what that's doing is it's going to move to the left while rotating to the right. And that creates an orbit. So you can see we're just circling around the area that we're shooting this video at. And if I do the opposite, I pull the right joystick to the right and the left joystick to the left and I just feather it slightly. I'm not putting a whole lot of pressure on these joysticks. You can see that it's moving slower and it's doing this circle motion. Now I have another video that I did here on my channel that goes through tons of drone moves that jumps off basically what we just talked about and goes through a ton of different combinations on how to use these two joysticks and this jog wheel to get creative looking shots. And I'll link to that down below in the description so you can check it out after this. But once you learn the basics, you'll wanna use two to three different moves in unison to create dynamic footage. All right, so the next section I wanna talk about is active track. Now, active track is a feature that allows you to track a subject, whether that's a person, a car, a boat, a train, whatever that object is that's in motion, you can use your active track to be able to follow that object and you don't actually have to touch the controller. And there's a few things that you can do with active track that's really cool. So let me just show you how this works. First, we're gonna grab the subject that you wanna film. So let's just grab me because I'm gonna be walking around here and we're gonna track me. So on the screen, you wanna draw a box around your subject. All right, it's found me as the subject and you can see right now it's in spotlight mode. So spotlight mode is basically the drone is just gonna stay in one place and wherever I move, the drone is going to follow and just keep me in the center. So you can use this as basically a moving tripod in the sky if you wanna follow your subject and not move the drone. Now what's also cool is you can grab your subject and you can move the drone using your joysticks and the drone is going to be moving while keeping that subject centered. So it's almost a easy way to be able to shoot a scene with a subject and not have to worry about trying to keep that subject always perfectly centered, but you're more focused on the controls of where the drone is in the sky. So I'm gonna start moving the drone. I'm gonna move it to the right and up, and you can see it's creating this kind of orbit around while it's keeping me in the center. And I just created a really dynamic shot that's hard to do manually because the drone is tracking and keeping me centered the whole time. And so now I'm gonna bring the drone down and forward keeping me centered. And you'll see as it comes over me, it's gonna point directly down. Creating like that rocket ship droney effect. So I'm bringing the drone down. I'm not touching the gimbal at all. And the gimbal is keeping me perfectly centered the entire time. So it's a super easy way to get creative shots and you don't have to worry about making sure your subject is centered because the drone is doing all that for you. So beyond just the spotlight mode, you have point of interest and you have active track. So let me jump up on this. We're gonna bring the drone up so it's, there's no obstructions. We're gonna click point of interest. And now we hit go. You could slide this disc further to the right or to the left. And so that's the directionality. So I wanna move to the right fast. Now the drone is gonna spin in a complete circle around me indefinitely. It's just gonna keep spinning. 
and you could actually move the drone while it's doing this movement. So you can see as I spin around, I'm gonna push up on the left joystick, the drone's gonna ascend into the sky while keeping me right in the center. So I'm creating a spiral effect and I can do the same thing. I'm gonna bring the drone down and it's gonna come down, keeping me centered, move the gimbal so that it always has a shot with me in the center. Now, one thing that's pretty cool about this using this active track is you don't always have to keep your subject centered the entire time. So if you want your subject off to the right third, you just pull left or right on the left joystick and it will change your center point. So right now, you can see I'm in the right third. So if I do my point of interest from here, you'll see that it's gonna spin in that same arc, but it's gonna keep me in that right third rather than keeping me dead center. And this is something that you might wanna use if you wanna get these creative shots and not always have your subject dead center. You can shift them to the left or to the right. And the last thing I wanna go through with this section is active track. So on the left, you'll see that there's this active track button. And right now it's tracking me from behind. So as I start walking, I'm gonna hit go. It's gonna find the direction that I'm walking and then it's gonna go behind me. And it's pretty cool that you could set which direction that you want the drone to move to follow your subject. So if I wanna change this, I click the little icon in the bottom and then I click left. The drone is gonna swing over to my left and follow me from the left. And so it's gonna take a second to figure out orientation, but then once it finds that spot, it'll just continue to track the person or the car, or whatever it is that you're tracking from that directionality. Now let's go from the front. So it's gonna swing to my front side and then it will start tracking me from the front. So it's always gonna be looking for that orientation and it will start tracking from that directionality. So I just found this little area to stop. Let's hit point of interest. Let's go to the left about a medium speed, press go. Now it's gonna spin around me and I'm gonna show this epic view this direction. Cool, let's stop it. Let's click active track again. Let's follow from my right side, which is gonna be over here. And let's hit go. So now it should follow me back as a side shot. And the thing is, when you're working with active track in the cine or normal mode, it's gonna be using the vision sensors on the drone, so you're not gonna hit anything. Because the sensors can see if there's an object in the way, front, back, side to side, up and down, it's omnidirectional. So anything that you might encounter, the drone's gonna stop. And I'm gonna show you how this works as we get towards this tree. I'm just gonna walk in a circle here so the drone should swing off this way. And there's this big tree in the way. And what it's gonna do is stop, bypass the tree, and it's gonna look for that subject. Now I'm not in frame so it doesn't see me and it's gonna turn off the active track. So active track isn't perfect, but if your subject does have a visual line of sight, it will keep tracking that subject. Let's go back to active track. Let's go from the back right corner. So you can also do the corners. You don't have to do forwards, backwards, left or right. You can do from an angle as well. So it's gonna follow me from this back right angle as I hike through this trail. And just from doing this little bit of walking around, you can see how you can get super dynamic shots when you're out by yourself filming or you're working with a subject that's moving in a lot of different directions because the drone's always gonna be keeping that subject centered as long as there's a clear line of sight. I'm gonna turn back around. Now I'm gonna move the complete opposite direction and you see the drone needs to swing up and over me to find that back right corner that I have set. And now it's following me from that direction. So if you wanna use active track, what I suggest you do is take this out to a place like this where it's open and you have some different things that you can play around with and just try all of these settings because 
the more that you play with it, the more that you'll get an understanding of how it works and when it actually doesn't work. Because if I was to go behind these columns back here, you'll see that it will skip and try to find me and it doesn't work that good, at least with the current firmware. But if you have a clear open area, the drone will always keep you locked on. Now your active track does not work with the explore mode. So if you wanna shoot with that longer lens, you can only do it in manual settings. You can't use the active track. Okay, so next let's talk about master shots. And this is an automated way to put a few different shots together that's gonna create a quick little sequence. And DJI has these preset shot lists put together. All you have to do is center your subject, select them on the screen and hit go, and it's gonna automatically create a video out of that. So let's walk over here to this little peak over here and we'll show you how it works. So the first thing that you wanna do is click the little film strip icon, click master shots, it's gonna say, based on the subject and distance, the aircraft will automatically shoot a number of clips and create a sequence out of it. Okay, I'm gonna grab the subject, you just click on that plus icon, and then it's gonna give you a few different options. So these are basically the settings that are gonna control how far away, how far distance around, and how high the drone is gonna to go to create this master shot. So let's click start and let's do a master shot. You'll see on the right hand side where the record button is, there's now an X with a percentage. So what it's doing is gonna record a few different shots and it's going to fill up this percentage for each one. So it did that first shot, it zoomed out. Now it's doing the second shot, a circle, a medium, and it's gonna prompt you as it goes to tell you what it's doing. And if you wanna stop this at any time, you can just click the red X and it's gonna stop the recording. But we'll let this run. It's gonna take about two minutes here. So the drone flies back to the original location and then you could start flying it again. So let's turn off the master shots, put it back just to video and we'll fly back around here manually, come back to this camera. So an easy way to create these little sequences of shots if you just wanna grab something cool of the area that you're in. Now it's not gonna track a moving subject, it just picks a spot on the earth and then does all these shots around that one area. Now, Quick Shots is a very similar feature. It's not available in the current firmware that I have at the time of making this video, but Quick Shots are basically single shots with an automation built in, so you don't have to control the drone at all, and it makes it really easy to create these different effects that DJI has programmed for you in the software. So let's talk about hyperlapses. Basically a hyperlapse is a time lapse, but it's moving. And in a, with a drone, because they're so stable, you can create these really dynamic looking shots. So in your menu, you're gonna click your film strip icon, go down to hyperlapse, and it's gonna give you a few options. You can freely move the drone, you can circle it, you can do a course lock, or you can do a waypoint. Let's do a circle because of where we're at, and we'll just do this really quick. So I'm gonna grab the subject, which is me standing right here. You could say the intervals that you wanna take your photos, the length of the desired video at the end, and the speed that you want the drone to fly. So we'll let this run for three minutes, and this will be a quick three second shot. But a lot of times you wanna use a hyperlapse in a setting where you have things like clouds moving or over a period of time, or you have like the sun setting or the sun rising. You want some sort of action happening in the footage. And then when you use this hyperlapse over the course of say like 10 minutes, or 20 minutes, you'll create really cool looking shots that have a lot of movement and show the passage of time, but also the drone is moving in the sky. So a super unique shot. All right, so we finished the hyperlapse and this is what it looks like. Super quick hyperlapse but you can see how powerful this is with using a drone that's stable in the sky and being able to move in all these different directions. Mm -hmm. 
And the last two features that you have are photography and panoramic mode. So in photo mode, you have a few different options. So you just have a single shot. Let's take a photo. Great, we just took a photo. And you could use the button on the top of your controller to take the photo or the white button on the right hand side to take a photo. Now when you click this, you can click AEB. So this is gonna take a series of shots that are different exposures. And this you might wanna use if you're in a setting where you have bright skies and a little bit darker ground. So let's do five. Now it's gonna take a series of shots. Normal exposure, darker, brighter, even darker, and even brighter. Now the last mode you have is your time shot. So you could set how much time that you want to wait before the takes a photo. All right, so let's switch it to two seconds. And you'll see that it's taking a photo every two seconds. So if you wanna do a time lapse and you just wanna have the camera as like a tripod in the sky, well, you can use this setting here and just manually do a time lapse. It's just gonna take a photo every two seconds. So great feature if you need to like have a situation where you're moving around, you want it to be taking photos, you can set up how much time in between each shot and it's constantly gonna just take photos at that interval. So I've been shooting all of this in auto exposure, but if you did wanna take full control and go manual, you click in the lower right hand corner and then you can set all of your settings depending on the situation that you're flying in. So we've gone through everything on the DJI Mavic 3 and how to actually fly the drone, but now what do you shoot with this drone? That's a question that is going to change based on what your use case is. So are you someone who wants to just take photos or are you someone who wants to shoot video? And then also you have to ask yourself, well, what are you going to use this video for? I think the trap that a lot of us will get into is getting to a really pretty spot and then just grabbing a bunch of footage or a bunch of photos without actually having a plan of what you're gonna do with that footage or those photos. But the vast majority of us wanna use this for a specific purpose, whether that is helping tell a better story or have some cool photos to post on our Instagram. So the biggest question you need to ask yourself is what is the end goal? So what do you want to achieve using this camera? The Mavic 3 is just like any other camera. It's a tool to capture a scene or help tell a story. When I first got into flying drones, I would just shoot a lot of pretty shots, put it together, but it ended up being pretty boring when you just see a bunch of shots strung together with no real reason of why they're together. So when I'm going out to fly, I always try to have a purpose before I actually take the drone off and start flying. For me personally, I'm either shooting for clients or I'm shooting for videos here on my channel. And I'm not gonna just use a drone just because it looks cool. I'm gonna use it to help tell my story or to help enhance the video that I'm creating. So when I approach what I'm filming, I think about it in terms of how do I want to use this footage for the story that I'm telling. So recently I went up to Death Valley and I was shooting a project with my buddies around driving through this area in California and the different obstacles that we were encountering. Now, Death Valley is a national park, so you can't fly a drone. That is one thing you have to keep in mind. You have to look at your local laws and regulations. However, for this story, we actually started in BLM land before and after the park. So I actually used the drone to set the stage and shoot the first scene, and then to shoot the final scene when we were leaving. It was a great way to open and close this video, and I used the shots to set the scene of where we're at to show someone this part of California and what it looks like. So a good way to use your drone is to set the scene, to show areas from this perspective that you can't get with other cameras, show these big open landscapes. It's a great way just to capture the view and really show this unique perspective. Now, another project I recently shot, I was out in Utah and I was in BLM land so I could fly the drone pretty much anywhere for the majority of this trip. Now, there was an area that we were at that had this crazy landscape. It was all these weird, colorful mountains. And I used my drone to create a sequence. So instead of just being a few shots to open or close the scene, I tr created an entire sequence out of my shots to progress someone through us actually interacting with the space. And if you're struggling on how to put shots together for a sequence, I do have more videos on my channel and I'll link to them down below in the description. But a great way to go about creating a sequence is think of it in seven shots. 
two wides, two mediums, two close-ups, and one that's kind of unique and something different. And the good thing about drones is you can easily get that unique and different shot by just putting the drone straight up above and looking straight down. That's a perspective you can only get with a drone. So think of how you could get two different wide shots from a scene, think of how you can get two different mediums, and think of how you can get two different close-ups. And with that, Think about movement. So how are you gonna move the drone? Are you gonna be moving it left to right, up, down, forward, backwards? Are you gonna spin around? There's so many dynamic shots that you can make with your drone. And when you start stringing these together and you have your subject moving through the scene, progressing from point A to point B, well, you'll be able to create a sequence. For, so for this scene, we were climbing these mountains and the final shot is us getting to the summit and looking at the landscape. It's a very simple storyline us getting to these mountains, climbing up, and then being at the top. But I shot it with this progression in mind, and I was able to cut together this little sequence in the video that feels a lot more engaging than if it was just a few shots of the pretty landscape. So one of the biggest things that you can do when you're working with your drone is think, how can I use this tool to show my audience this area that we're at in a different view, from a different perspective? So if you're shooting photos, What's a different shot than just putting the drone up and looking out over the landscape? So for example, I have three photos here up on my wall that I've taken. They're all the straight down perspective. And I really love this shot with a drone because it's so unique. And when you get the drone up in the sky, you can see the landscape from a completely different perspective. Also, think about shadows. Shadows are gonna completely change when you're up above looking down at objects. You can see how they interact with the landscapes differently, and you can get unique shots that you just don't get using other cameras. So use your Mavic 3 as a tool to find these different perspectives, and the more that you fly, the more that you'll get used to finding these different shots and figuring out ways to use the drone that will feel more creative than just putting the drone up and looking straight out over the landscape. So the next section, let's talk about editing and color grading. So when it comes to editing your footage, you don't just wanna put full clips up from your drone and just think that somebody wants to watch a whole 30 second, 40 second shot of just a landscape. You wanna cut that down and make something interesting for your viewer to watch. Now, I did an entire two hour course on how to edit, and I'll link to that down below in the description. It's on Skillshare, and if you've never used Skillshare before, you can get your first 30 days for free. So you can take this course completely free within that first 30 days. But I did wanna include a section from that course in this video. I wanna show you how you can edit your drone shots together and add some music and cut to the beat to be able to create sequences that are more engaging to watch. So this is a small section from that full course. Okay, so now let's add some music to the project because music is always gonna enhance your edit and make it more dynamic. I'm gonna use this little sequence from Alaska. I recut the B-roll and what I wanna do is layer on a little bit of music underneath the A-roll and then as soon as we get into the B-roll transition, I wanna have the music come up louder and actually cut to the beat of the music. Now, one technique that I like to use when I'm doing music sections in my videos is cutting to the beat. So every time that there's a major beat in the song, I'll make a cut. And this actually enhances the visual experience because it, you feel every time there's a cut. If you have a song with every four count, there's a big beat, well, that's a good point to cut your video and go to the next shot. And it actually flows super nicely when you're cutting to the beat rather than just doing random cuts throughout the song. So first, let me just show you this clip. Let's play it. Let me turn up this audio for you. Yeah, we just got to the Columbia Glacier, flew through it a little bit, and now we're like on this beach, watching it from a distance, but this is like, this is why I came up to Alaska to test out the Mavic 3 Pro. I mean, this, this is insane. So a little bit of everything that we've been talking about, I did a cut with some A-roll, I covered those cuts with some B-roll on top of it, and then I also did a fade transition here into the sound of the Mavic 3 taking off for a flight. Now I have some B-roll that I wanna use coming up, but I wanna select my music first before I cut the sequence. So let's pull in a music track, let's pull in two music tracks, one ambient music track, 
and then one that's gonna have more of a beat for that B-roll sequence. Now I get all of my music from Epidemic Sound. I've been using them for years and it's a great way to get royalty free music that you can use anywhere. One of the big issues that's gonna come up when you're using music for YouTube is that licensed content is gonna get flagged. And so if you don't wanna have your videos taken down or you don't wanna have some issues, you wanna use royalty-free music. And there's a bunch of websites out there. I've used them all, but my favorite has been Epidemic Sound. And you could get a ton of music from this one source that you can use basically anywhere. And then also they have a lot of sound effects available. I'll include a link to Epidemic Sound in the resources section, but let's find a couple tracks and I'll show you my process when I'm looking for music. So this is Epidemic Sound and I'm gonna just go into the music tab and I'm gonna go in genre and I wanna find something ambient. So I typically go to the electronic ambient section and I'll just start listing for the different songs. has a nice sound to it, it's just an ambient track. I'm gonna be putting it pretty low over my A-roll. I'm gonna download that one. Now let's find something with more of a beat. Let's go back to genres. I know there's some good stuff in Future Bass and let's just find something that sounds great. Okay, so I like this track because it's a little bit slower and I know I'm gonna be cutting shots of the glacier and I don't wanna be going boom, 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 but I still wanna to cut to the beat. So let's download this one as well. Great, I got two music tracks. So in my event, I'm gonna make a new keyword for music. Now what I'm gonna do is bring these into this project. So they're on my desktop here and I'm gonna just add them to this keyword by dragging and dropping them in. So there are both of those. I'm gonna use my list view. This one is the ambient track, and you can see as I scrub through it, you're gonna hear it. I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use this section. I'm gonna drag it, drop it down here. I'm gonna cut that first section. This is kind of what I want. Okay, so if I just wanna hear the music without anything else, I can click the headphone icon here, and it's gonna solo this clip. So I only hear this track. Now I'm gonna do a little bit of fade in on the front half, play it. And let's pull up our audio meters and you can see this is hitting negative 12-ish. I'm gonna drag it down slightly. I want it a little bit lower. And then now we're gonna have this shot where I'm taking off. I'm actually gonna cut the music there, delete that section, and I'm gonna slowly let that just fade out and you can hear it just slowly fades out in this section because I'm gonna start bringing in some other music. So let's turn off the headphones, which is the solo. Find that song that has the beat. Okay, so that's where I want that first clip to drop for this B-roll sequence. It's kind of a build up and then boom, I want that first shot to hit. So I'm gonna drag this down. I just set an endpoint to somewhere around there. So you see this point here where it's steep? That's the first beat of the song. I wanna line that up with this point here. So I can even put my cursor there as a line so I could see where I wanna shift this. And let's put it right there. So let's solo this clip. Let's turn on our audio. So as soon as it hits that beat, you see I flip the camera. Now, this music is really loud. It's hitting around zero. So I'm gonna bring this down to mix with the other audio that I've been working with. Somewhere around negative six makes sense for this edit because the rest of my audio has been mixed around that level for the A-roll. Now let's listen to what happens before that beat drops. So I wanna fade this in, it's some chimes. I'm gonna have this other ambient track fade out. I'm gonna have these chimes fade in, and then I'm gonna have that beat drop right when we start the B-roll sequence. All right, so let's take the solo off. This shot here is the drone audio of it taking off. I'm gonna use V to just silence that because I just wanna listen to the music. Or 
I can highlight both of these and isolate just both of those. So there's different ways that you could do the same thing in Final Cut. It just comes down to what makes sense for you while you're editing. So I just soloed just these two music tracks because I want to hear how they blend. So let's listen. This one fades out. Maybe I want a few more chimes, but I want to change this. So this down here, it has this kind of arc. So it, it gets quiet and then gets louder quicker. Well, I'd like that to drag out and be quieter longer and then ramp up. So I could control click this point and you could see I have these different types of curves. I like using the S curve. So it, it takes a little bit longer to get louder and then it kind of goes up at a steep angle and then tapers off. For this kind of a transition, I like using that. Okay, cool. All right, so we have a great little transition there. We have some music ambience that's gonna be underneath me talking into this little transition section where I take the drone off to me flying the drone with the beat. Now let's figure out where the cut points are gonna be for the music track. So I wanna find the beats and I'm just gonna to listen to it and I'm gonna use my marker to be able to mark each one of those beats. Now the marker tool is M on the keyboard. So every time you click M, you're gonna create a marker on whatever shot is selected. Now this marker is just what it sounds like. It's just a marker so you know where that point is. And you could use those to snap different things to a marker or just so you know where things are. So I'm gonna delete this, control click, delete. And let's listen and set some markers. So just by listening and sound listening for those beats, I set markers where I think my edits are gonna be. Now I could go through and just cut my B-roll to hit on each one of those edits. So let's just do that real quick. So I just did a quick cut using markers only and just grabbing some shots and throwing it in. Let's play this back and see how it cuts together. So that's enough shots that I want for that sequence. And now I want the music to taper off. So one of the things I like to do is change around my song. So I might only want that one section, but then I want the end of the music to come a little bit forward. So we're gonna use a storyline and we're gonna cut this music up a little bit. So the first thing I wanna do is find where this beat is. So this last marker is on a beat where it goes into another verse of this kind of harder hitting beat, but I want the softer beat that you have at the end of the video. So I'm gonna find this. So first I'm gonna highlight this music selection. I'm gonna control click, create storyline. I'm gonna zoom in. I'm gonna make a cut at this beat. I'm gonna go find where I want the end of the song to start playing right there. So I'm gonna delete this section. And then now I've seamlessly cut the track so that it moves a little faster and I don't have more of that heavy beat. And on that beat, I wanna add another shot. We just flew in a helicopter <laughs> to like five different spots. Jake's like, you know, come up to Alaska, we'll do some cool stuff. And I end up in a helicopter flying to these peaks. like. So what I want the music to do at this section is play lower and then slowly fade out because from here we would go into a whole section about talking about this experience. So I'm going to unsolo that A roll. I'm going to just turn off all this so that we're focused on one thing and I want this music to drop down lower. So I'm going to change the volume. I'm going to go to my inspector. It's at negative 6.4 right now. Let's bring that down to like negative 16 and I'm going to do 
a transition fade between the two music points. So I'm gonna do Apple T, it's gonna create this fade. We just flew in a helicopter to like five different spots. Jake's like, you know, come up to Alaska, we'll do some cool stuff. And I end up in a helicopter. So I'm gonna cut out some of that music. I'm gonna fade this out from the right side by just fading it that way. And so now you get a clear picture of how my music is built into my video. My lower music here, which goes under this A roll, I slowly ramp that down and slowly ramp up this song. I cut to the beat of the music and then I do a transition here and then I do a transition here to this part of the song that's 10 decibels lower than this part, just so I could have it as underneath and a good transitional moment, and then I fade that out. And so I'm constantly doing this in my videos where I'm fading in music, fading out, and I'm using it to create a flow and pace out my videos so that sometimes there is a lot of music and sometimes there's no music at all. And you just wanna make sure that when you're using music, you're not just blasting your viewer with music. If you're doing a review or a tutorial, there might be times where you wanna have music underneath. There might be times where you just want it quiet. Now, if you're doing a story piece, there's a lot of times where, yeah, you're gonna want a B-roll transition and music is really gonna help with that and really enhance the story. All right, so let's just play this back and you can hear how the music flows with this whole section of video. Yeah, we just got to the Columbia Glacier, flew through it a little bit, and now we're like on this beach, watching it from a distance, but this is like, this is why I came up to Alaska to test out the Mavic 3 Pro. I mean, this, this is insane. flew in a helicopter to like five different spots. Jake's like, you know, come up to Alaska, we'll do some cool stuff. And I end up in a helicopter flying to these peaks. Like, I think it's a great start. And you can see that there is a lot of issues with this edit. Like we need to go through, fix a lot of the clips. Obviously a lot of it's not color graded yet. And then there's just a lot of little tweaks. But the key thing is, with any video that you're creating, you really wanna get this down first. You wanna just like put all the pieces there and then you can go through and do your little tweaks and clean it up and make it much better. But the key is get that first cut done. When you can get that first cut done, and that's the hardest part to do. The first cut is always the toughest to get out, but once you've got past that, you can see all the elements and you can see where you wanna add stuff or take stuff away. All right, so let's dig into some basics of color grading because in this drone you have D-Log and you have the normal mode. Now normal is a look that's ready to go. You don't have to do any color grading with normal, only if you wanna do something creative on top of the look that you're getting out of camera. Now D-Log, you're preserving your highlights and preserving your shadows. So the idea with D-Log is you're getting more dynamic range, which means that you can create cinematic looking shots from your footage. So here's a shot that I have from the Toronto Pinnacles. This is an area I went and explored recently. And you can see how flat this is. Now I'm using Final Cut Pro for all of my editing, but a lot of these tools you'll find in other editing software as well. So I'm gonna bring up my Luma waveforms. And an Aluma waveform is all of your exposure values from zero being black to 100 being white. And you can see right here on the left side, this is my Aluma waveform, and all of my exposure is in the middle. It's a very flat, ungraded image. And then I'm gonna pull up my vector scope as well, which is showing all my saturation, and you can see that the dot is in the center. There's not very much saturation in this footage, so, so you're not seeing any color extending out to the different directions. So let me show you what happens when you add some contrast and some color. I'm gonna just use the basic tools and I'm gonna drop the shadows down to zero and the highlights way past 100. And you can see now this footage has tons of contrast and on this graph, you'll see that there's lots of exposures that are over 100 and a lot that are under zero. And so I effectively just added contrast into this footage. Now this doesn't look super good. This is just a sample for me to show you how these graphs work. And then I'm gonna take my global settings, which is basically everything, and I'm gonna boost the saturation. 
So this image now is a lot of contrast and a lot of saturation, and you can see that here on these two graphs. So once you dig more into color grading, you're gonna use your vector scope and your Luma waveforms to help see the different exposures and color values. But let's just do a quick color grade on this footage to show you how you can take this D-log and actually make a good looking shot without doing a ton of color grading. Basically what I wanna do is add contrast, but I don't want my highlights to blow out and I don't want my shadows to get too dark. So I'll take my highlights, I'm gonna bring them up towards 100, and then I'm gonna bring my shadows and I'm gonna bring them down towards zero. And then overall, I wanna darken this image. I'm gonna take the mid-tones, I'm gonna bring those down slightly, it's, and I'm gonna tweak the highlights. And now I have contrast in the footage. It needs a little saturation, so I'm just gonna take my overall saturation and bump it up. And now when I turn this effect on and off, you'll see that very quickly we have a much better looking shot. And this was just a basic color grade, bringing your highlights up, bringing your shadows down, and then changing your mids to your liking, and then adding saturation. That's all it really takes to get good looking footage from D-Log. If you wanna make this even easier, what you can use is a conversion LUT. So in Final Cut Pro, I could just search for LUT, and there is a plugin called Custom LUT, and I just drag that onto my footage. Now with this plugin, I can add a Mavic 3 conversion that I've built, and overall my footage just looks still washed out, which means I've probably overexposed it a little bit, so I'm just gonna bring down my exposure overall. So using a conversion LUT just makes it a lot faster to edit and grade your footage. And as you can see with this footage, it's not perfect all the time. If I take off these color wheels, you could see that I exposed too bright. So I needed to bring down my exposure, but all I had to do was tweak the exposure overall. I didn't have to go through and tweak individual components to be able to get my footage to look good. Now what you can do from here is do creative looks. So if you wanna get deeper into color grading, you can come up with different ways to tweak this footage and make it look a lot different. This is just straight out of camera with a little contrast and saturation. But let me just show you if I was to use hue and saturation curves. I could actually change the hue of this landscape. So I'll grab this area here and I'm gonna make it more red. And then I'm gonna grab the sky and I'm gonna tweak it a little bit more teal. And then I want the sky to have a little bit more saturation so I can use a hue saturation curve and bring up my saturation just in the sky. And then I could use a hue luma curve and I can bring down the exposure of the landscape a tad. And then I could add a vignette and darken the corners using a Final Cut Pro plugin. And now I've completely changed the look of the shot. That was just a quick sample to show you what you can do with your color grading. But if this is something that you wanna dig deeper into, I'll include a link down below in the description to some videos around color grading. And it will dig into how you can learn to use all of these tools. But if you just wanna use LUTs, you can quickly add a look and do something similar without going through the process of manually color grading. So I'm gonna take all this off and go back to that original just look with the conversion LUT. And I'm gonna add a secondary LUT that just has a look. So we're gonna use my JD Hollywood, which is a LUT that I've created. And you can see right there, just adding that LUT does a very similar look to the custom one that we just built. So you can find LUTs from creators that you like and put them on your footage and be able to create looks super fast. And all I do is dial in my mix. So at 100%, that's a really strong looking LUT. I'll just bring that down to a spot that I think looks good. And sometimes that's like 50%, 75%, and it completely changes the look of the shot. Now let me try a different LUT. This one's much more yellow and a little bit more washed out. You can see strong. This one actually looks pretty cool for the shot. And if you wanna use my drone LUTs, I'll include that down below in the description as well. I know this was a super long video, but there is a lot to talk about when it comes to flying drones. And if you have any questions, please let me know down in the comments. Now next, I highly suggest you jump into this video here, which goes through a ton of different drone moves that you can use to get better looking footage. I'll see you on the next video.